surgery and this miserable cold that is affecting a lot of us. So I'll keep an eye on the and maybe a stick to your seats more. <laughs> Okay, Ryan, I think we're ready to begin. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is a City Planning Commission special meeting held in New York City City Planning Commission hearing room, Lower Concourse 120 Broadway. Today is Monday, October 15th, and the time is 105. I will now call the roll. Chair Lago. Here. Vice Chair Knuckles. Commissioner Capelli. Here. Commissioner Cirillo. Here. Commissioner De La Ouz. Here. Commissioner Dweck. Here. Commissioner Eady. Here. Commissioner Efron. Commissioner Knight. Commissioner Levin. Here. Commissioner Marin. Here. Commissioner Ortiz. Here. A quorum is present. Let's turn to page one of the calendar. Reports, Borough of the Bronx, calendar numbers one and two, CD one. Calendar number one, C180391, PQX. Calendar number 2C180390HAX in the matter of applications for acquisition of property for UDAP designation and disposition of city owned property concerning 599 Cortland Avenue for favorable reports on calendar numbers 1 and 2. Chair Lago? Yes. Commissioner Capelli? Yes. Commissioner Cirillo? Yes. Commissioner De La Ouz? Yes. Commissioner Dweck? Yes. Commissioner Eady? Yes. Commissioner Levin? Yes. Commissioner Marin? Yes. Commissioner Ortiz? Yes. Favorable reports have been adopted on calendar numbers one and two. I believe this concludes the special meeting of the New York City Planning Commission on Monday, October 15th. The time is now 106. Uh, before we begin our agenda, we have a video presentation uh, created by our press office. Just take a moment. We are so proud of the DCP team, we wanted to share this with the commissioners. <laughs> helping to facilitate the public review process. Land use review is one of the sort of technical arms, but of city planning. We prepare the commissioner's packages, right? So these are briefing materials the commissioner's needs for those meetings that happen every other week. And every other Friday, we prepare this giant document for them, which they get delivered and get to read so that they can be prepared to have a discussion and raise any concerns they have uh, within their purview about the project. We are responsible for putting it all together, uh, keep, like assembling everything and making sure that everything is orderly and clear and that there's the information that's necessary to make these commissioners as well informed as possible is provided to them. And that happens at Land Use Review. Uh, my first iteration here, I was actually for five years the first legal assistant um, in council's office. When I would sit and listen at these public meetings, I would hear the critique and the analysis, but I didn't. I knew that I didn't understand what it took to actually make this building. I felt that it was really important for me to understand like what it took to build, to design and build an actual structure. So that's what actually set me off to um, architecture graduate school. Um, after I graduated, I worked for about nine months um, as a construction manager. So that was like my real experience, like being on site, like doing gut renovations and learning like what it took to put a building together. The understanding I have of building and challenges, not just for, it enhances my understanding of planning. Like these challenges in construction and design are so interrelated. Yes, it's important to be a resident, it's supposed to be a member of the public, a user of space, but it's also really valuable to have this educational background in what it means to design, what it means to plan, and what it means to build in order to kind of appreciate the nuance and the depth of, you know, what we are trying to do and like understanding deeply how challenging it is to build in a city like ours. The new hearing room really does allow for increased accessibility for more members of the public. It, I feel like it provides more transparency because so many more people can attend. 
you know, this space permits that. Uh, it's a special project that I managed because of my background in construction management and because it's my division in land use review, our division, um, that actually facilitates these meetings. So understanding the spatial needs of the commissioners, of the general public, the limitations of the existing space that we had to build in, um, how the movement and the routine and the, the procession or like of each meeting actually operates was really helpful. Um, there's much new features that we never had the capacity to do, which is make things public more quickly. Maybe, you know, we're gonna be able to live stream. If you come to our public meetings, which I encourage you to do, you'll enter and you'll be greeted at a reception desk. You can receive a copy of the agenda. You can, eventually we will have electronic sign-in, which will make things also much more seamless and improve. But the nice features include like displaying in a digital format, like what project we're on. And now at least people can follow along outside of the hearing room. In our overflow space, we call it, um, you can sit and actually watch a TV monitor what's happening inside. These features of make I think a better space for the public to gather and uh, allows them a feeling of respect to actually come and to be a part of this public review process. Okay. So, <laughs> we, thank you, Hannah. We, we've done a number of these, and we thought that at um, each review session, we'll start it with profiling a member of our team. But we thought it particularly appropriate that the first was of Hannah, who brought us this beautiful space. So now on to the more serious work. Sure. Uh, this is the review session of the New York City Planning Commission of October fifteenth. 2018 is held in 120 Broadway, a lower concourse hearing room. The time is 1.11. Um, item number one has been laid over. Uh, item number two, uh, page one, is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendments in Bronx Community District 1. Takiya Jordan is here to present. New York City Housing Authority's Patances uh, Campus in the South Bronx. The applicant, the New York City Housing Authority, or NYCHA, is seeking approval of land use actions that, if approved, would facilitate the development of a new 15-story mixed-use building comprised of 101 units of affordable housing and approximately 8,500 square feet of commercial space. <laughs> The applicant is proposing a change in zoning from the current R6C14 overlay to an R7X C24 overlay and a text amendment to establish mandatory inclusionary housing designation on the site. The rezoning area pursuant to this application includes both the development site and an adjacent existing residential building. The development as proposed will also require mayoral overrides for setback, number of stories, street tree, and required parking regulations. The project under consideration is in the Mott Haven neighborhood of the Southern Bronx and Community District 1. Uh, the Batances 6 site was explored along with one other on the Batances campus as a, a potential site for development during the Make Mott Haven transformation plan planning process. The plan itself was published in 2014 and was funded through HUD's Choice Neighborhood Initiative with a planning grant. The plan was developed with extensive community engagement over several years. And while NYCHA ultimately did not receive a second round of funding for implementation, uh, the plan did inform uh, it, the strategic plan that led NYCHA to move forward with an RFP for this particular site. During the planning process, the community identified the need to expand both community facility and commercial opportunities along with um, additional affordable housing development. And so two sites at Batances will be uh, developed, Batances 6, which is before you today, 
will address the need for new and expanded retail options along with affordable housing. And the Batances 5 site, which is not subject to review here at CPC, will feature new community facility space. And currently, NYCHA has um, several active projects in the Bronx that are part of um, Next Gen. The Millbrook Houses, uh, Twin Parks West, Morrisania Air Rights Buildings are all in pre-development. And so this is a part of a larger push that NYCHA is making in the Bronx. Uh, the predominant land uses in the area surrounding the, re the rezoning, the proposed rezoning, are multifamily residential buildings, single story commercial uses, with scattered institutional uses, including the, uh, some offices of the Human Resources Administration and the Horizon Juvenile Center. South Bronx Prep Middle and High Schools and PS27 are a few of the schools in the immediate neighborhood. Clock Playground is located with this, within three blocks uh, to the southwest. It's not shown here on the map. It's just out of um, the map range. And the recently renovated St. Mary's Park, which is about an acre, is shown here at the bottom right of the map. Um, and it was, it was just renovated by the Parks Department. Willis Avenue that runs along the west of the site um, has, is a wide street that serves as a north-south corridor through the Mott Haven neighborhood and terminates at East 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, which is an area known as the Hub. It's about two blocks north of the site. The area is well served by public transit, including the two and five subway lines, which stop at the Hub, and numerous bus lines. So I wanted to just clarify um, something I described before, which is that the rezoning area includes both an existing uh, NYCHA building, as well as the development site, which is currently occupied by a single-story commercial structure. So this that I'm showing here are blocks 2291, lots 1 and 101, um, located on Willis, along Willis Avenue between East 146th and East 147th Streets. So in this rezoning area, the existing residential building is a five-story, 49-unit residential building. And the commercial structure shown here will be demolished prior to construction. There is an underground parking garage uh, that sits on the commercial site as well. In May of 2017, NYCHA and New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development or HPD, entered into negotiations with Batanza's six partners, which is the development team. That team includes the Limley and Wolf Companies and Alembic Community Development Corporation. The team was chosen as a result of a competitive RFP process. Um, and the development team will receive a ground lease for a term of 99 uh, years for the development site. Uh, the area surrounding um, the site is mapped primarily within an R6 zoning district, with the exception of C44 zoning to the north of the south site around 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, or the hub. C14 and C24 overlay districts are mapped on Willis Avenue and on Brook Avenue east of the development site. And there's also C22 commercial overlay districts along 3rd Avenue, one block west of the development site. Although there have not been major rezonings in this immediate area, there has been a significant amount of investment and redevelopment in and around the hub, bringing new institutional capacity to the area, such as Metropolitan College of New York and Bright Point Health, as well as major housing development, uh, such as the La Central housing development, along with others in the Melrose Urban Renewal Area, which will bring thousands of new housing units and commercial space to this neighborhood. Here are some photos of the site. So in the photo in the upper left, you can see the existing single-story commercial structure. Uh, there are leases on two of the storefronts in the building that were terminated in uh, 2015 and 2017 due to non-payment. 
and uh, those spaces have not been back on the market given the plan to demolish and construct. The third retail space is occupied currently by a furniture store and that lease will end in December of 2018. During the community outreach work that was completed by NYCHA, uh, community members really impressed upon the, the team uh, that a broader range of commercial options were they were interested in in the area. And so a part of the rezoning is in looking at that commercial overlay as an opportunity to expand and diversify retail options in this neighborhood. Um, and so in the upper right, you can also see a bit of that commercial structure, uh, as well as the adjacent residential building and a small courtyard between the two. And then finally, on the bottom left, is a, a image looking east on 146th Street, where you can just see a little bit of the residential character of the remainder of the block uh, where the building would sit. This is a site plan uh, for the site. The proposed development is a 15-story mixed-use building. The proposed development will be located on a lot currently occupied by the single-story commercial building we just saw. The development will be comprised of 101 apartments from the second to 15th stories with commercial uses and a residential lobby at the ground floor. The tentative unit mix includes a range from studios to three bedroom units. Open space for building residents will be provided on the second story of the building. No off-street parking is required. However, 51 bicycle spaces will be provided for tenants. Uh, one of the major considerations for the development team was setting back from the existing residential building and courtyard to the north of the development site to minimize shadows and to maintain as much of the open character of the existing site as possible. The applicant is therefore seeking overrides from height and setback requirements along East 146th Street, which is the southern uh, end of the site, through the mayoral override that I described earlier. And that would allow for this particular massing on the site. The applicant is also seeking a zoning map amendment from the existing R6C14 to R7XC24 to facilitate the construction of a significant number of affordable apartments. The zoning change would increase the allowable floor area on the development site to three to five for residential uses, but would re remain at two FAR for commercial uses. Uh, the proposed zoning would extend south the opportunity for higher density development already available in the C44 zoning district directly to the north. And the boundaries will also focus this density along Willis Avenue, which is a wide street and already active with ground floor uses. The proposed change to the existing commercial overlay uh, would also open up the mix of potential retail uses at that ground floor. Uh, the mandatory inclusionary housing designation proposed for this rezoning area is to map MIH option two, requiring that 30% of residential floor area be permanently affordable to residents with household incomes at an average of 80% of AMI, with no income ban exceeding 130% AMI. And currently the plan is to include about 30% of units for formerly homeless individuals. And the remainder of units would be available to individuals and families between 40 and 80% of AMI. I would say currently the uh, median household income in community district one is about $24,000. The proposed development would be 145 feet in height with the massing comprised of the ground floor and the building as designed sets back twice. It sets back once at the second story, about 19 feet from the interior courtyard, and then it sets back again at the seventh story, again about 19 feet. And as described earlier, this is meant to respect the existing open space and uh, character of the area as it is now. So here's a rendering of the site. This is uh, the south-facing portion 
of the building looking from Willis Avenue. In addition to the aforementioned purpose and goals of the rezoning, I, you know, I was sure to mention that this would go far to advance this neighborhood's Make Mott Haven transformation plan. Primary goals of that plan included expanding affordable housing, creating economic growth opportunities for residents, and improving neighborhood aesthetics. The applicant believes that this development proposal will go toward those goals as well as strengthen neighborhood character. And in discussions with the applicant, one of the things that stood out most was their commitment to working with a commercial broker to bring in a diverse mix of tenants at the ground floor and be really responsive to resident um, concerns and desires. So if there, if there are any questions, I'll try to answer them. Commissioner Deleuze. Hi, thanks Hi. for the presentation. Mm. Um, so just a couple different questions. One is, um, it would just be helpful when this comes back to um, have more information about the anticipated sources of financing um, for the project. The, you know, it's interesting that um, that option two is what's proposed given the median income in the community. I'm assuming that that was um, at the behest of either HPD or NYCHA um, to kind of maximize the percent of permanently affordable units. And if, if that's a strategy that the city's using, it would be helpful to kind of get, you know, briefed on that a bit more, especially given what a mismatch that is with the area median income. Um, and then um, I, I'm assuming this, this also has to go through a HUD approval process. Is it going to be concurrent? I, I believe because of the ground lease. Ground lease um, so it would be helpful to know if, like, where that is in this process um, and whether or not it's concurrent with, with ULERP or separate. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? <clears throat> Commissioner Ortiz. Hi. Hi. Um, good, good morning. Um, I had some uh, some questions around the retail. It seems that there's that's a big piece of what they're trying to accomplish here, sort of diversify the retail. And and um, going from C14 to C24 sort of broadens the mm -hmm. table of uses right. that are allowed. Could you describe the sort of new uses that are now allowed, you know, under this this proposed? Rezoning versus before. I'm, I'm just trying to find table the table of uses, but the use groups six through nine and fourteen. Right. What are what are those like? What will now be allowed as a result? Of I'm not sure off the top of my head. I would have to come back to you with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, that would be helpful. Um, and you know, my read of this is that we're going from. Uh, oh, what is this? Currently. Um, we're, we're increasing the number of square, the amount of square footage. Am I getting this backwards? Um, we're going from 8,560 square feet. No, we will have 8,500 8, square feet proposed. Proposed. Right. Okay. So thank you. Um, so we're going from 9,843 square feet to 8,560 mm -hmm. square feet. So it's interesting. We're going to less square footage, um, but they're looking for. Um, more diverse retail options, and they have a tenant who seems to be doing okay there. So mm -hmm. it would be helpful to understand a little bit about what they're really trying to accomplish um, around the rezoning, and in fact, if they'll they'll get what they're looking for. Um, so, thank you. Other questions, Commissioner Levin. <clears throat> Um, yes, the I guess the project, the rezoning area um, includes the existing yes. NYCHA building. Yes. Um, what's the logic for including that site, and will the rezoning have any effect on um, that building? No, it, it doesn't have an, uh, an effect on the existing building, other than. You know, the, there was originally parking required. There won't, you know, that, so that's being, relief is being sought from that through the mayoral override. Mm -hmm. But other than that, there would be no changes okay, required. So it will have, um, it's on a, it's it will have increased FAR associated with that site. Is any of that FAR being used in this new building? No. Okay. It's on a single, and it's on a single zoning lot. It is a single zoning. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So the potential is that that floor area could move around, but it's not. That's not my understanding, but no, okay. it's not. <laughs> We can come back after the, uh, when this returns to review session before the public hearing with more clarity about that. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, this application is certified. Okay, item number three, page 10 is a certification of a zoning map, zoning text, and city map amendments in the Bronx Community District 11. Uh, Justin Lamorella is here to present. Good afternoon. This is an application for a zoning map change, text amendment, and a city map change to facilitate the development of a mixed use building with approximately 228 units of affordable housing. The applicant is Blondell Equities LLC. The proposal is for portions of two blocks on Blondell Avenue and the Westchester Square area of Community District 11 in the Bronx. And the rezoning area shown here in blue uh, on the map, um, just to give you some more context, to the east lies the New York City Transit uh, rail yard for the six train. To the north is the Hutchinson Metro Center. And you can also see to the north the Amtrak rail lines um, where future Metro North service is proposed to begin in 2023. The Westchester Square stop at the Elevated 6 train is located um, down here on the map, um, which is approximately 600 feet from the rezoning area. There are also many bus routes in the area that run along East Tremont and Westchester Avenues. Residential uses are mostly concentrated uh, in the areas to the south, west, and northwest of the rezoning area, and the Williams Williams Bridge Road and Westchester Square areas. These neighborhoods include both single and multifamily residential buildings. The area's commercial uses are centered around the Westchester Square area, which is the, the neighborhood's principal shopping street and is part of the Westchester Square bid. Manufacturing, transportation, utility, and automotive uses um, and automotive related uses are mostly located in the underlying M11 district of which the subject area is located. This includes the rail yard that is located to the east of the development site um, as well. Uh, light manufacturing uses in this area are uh, generally one to two story detached buildings and often have adjacent uh, parking or storage yards. The existing zoning of the surrounding area is uh, predominantly an R6 zoning district located to the west and northwest of the rezoning area with commercial overlay districts on the major corridors. There's also the M11 district in which the development site is located, uh, which runs to the north and the south. And to the east beyond the rail yards are an R5 and R71 residential zoning district. Zooming into the area, uh, you can see the rezoning area in blue again and the development site in yellow. The subject area is located at the end of a block uh, bound by Westchester Avenue to the south, Blondell Avenue to the west, and light manufacturing businesses to the north with the rail yard again to the east. Directly north of the rezoning area uh, is an unbuilt portion of Ponton Avenue, which was approved for a demapping in 2014, but was never fully executed. The entire rezoning area is zoned M11, which has been in place since 1961. M11 districts allow for light manufacturing uses with an allowed FAR up to 1.0. The proposed rezoning area consists of nine lots spread across two blocks. And buildings in this area are one to two stories with mostly light manufacturing uses, including parking, auto-related repair, and auto storage, warehousing, and storage. There are also two non-conforming residential uses located within the rezoning area that would be brought into conformance. There's also um, commercial and um, vacant uses and lots. Just wanted to point out block 4133 lot eight, um, which is a cross-shaped lot that is currently utilized as a street right of way known as Cooper Avenue and Grant Street, um, but they are not mapped streets. However, an unbuilt but mapped portion of Fink Avenue, which is proposed to be eliminated as part of this application, um, is located here in, in pink. So we'll be talking about both of those areas, um, but they are different. Uh, the, the development site itself is entirely within the rezoning area, uh, but is limited to block 4134, lot one. It's approximately 46,000 square feet of lot area, with 155 feet of frontage on the former Ponson Avenue and extending 205 feet along Blondell Avenue. 
The development site is mostly vacant with a vacant non-conforming residential structure as well as parking and storage uses. So to give you some context for the area, here are some photos. Um, in this picture, we're at the corner of Westchester Avenue and Blondell, um, looking north towards the rezoning area. We have the elevated six train running above us. In this photo, we're on Blondell Avenue, um, looking north with the rezoning area to the right in this photo. A little bit further north, um, you can see uh, Grant Street to the right um, and part of the rezoning area. Uh, this is Cooper Avenue looking south towards the 6th train. And then this is from Ponton Avenue um, looking southeast towards the development site. So the applicant is proposing a new nine-story, 213,000 square foot mixed-use building with approximately 228 units of affordable housing. The first floor would have almost 20,000 square feet of commercial retail and about 2,000 square feet of community facility space, as well as 10 ground floor apartments. The remaining 218 units would be located on floors two through nine. The proposed development is not located within a transit zone and would provide 225 accessory parking spaces at the seller level within about 40,000 square feet of space. There would be 95 spaces for commercial, two for community facility, and 128 for residential. And the garage would be accessed via an entrance on Blondell Avenue, um, right here in this site plan. The proposed development would include 228 units in total, with 48 studio, studio apartments, 81 bedroom, 62 bedroom, and 43 bedroom apartments. The applicant intends to pursue option two of the MIH program, which would require that 30% of the proposed units, or 69 units in this case, would be permanently affordable of, at 80% of AMI. And there would also be 6,200 square feet of recreational space available to the future tenants of this building. The proposed building would have an FAR of 4.6 and rise to a maximum height of 95 feet. After a base height of approximately 75 feet, the building would set back 15 feet along Blondell Avenue before reaching the maximum height of 95 feet. And this shows a, a proposed rendering of the building. So in order to facilitate this development, the applicant is proposing to rezone <laughs> these blocks and lots from an M11 zoning district to an R7A district with a C24 commercial overlay. The R7A zoning district is a medium density zoning district that is appropriate in areas close to transit. R7A districts with the C24 overlay allows for residential uses and an increased density with 2.0 FAR for commercial uses and 4.6 FAR for residential uses under MIH. The R7A zoning district allows for base heights up to 75 feet and maximum heights up to 95 feet. The rezoning area extends beyond the development site to the south to Westchester Avenue in order to connect to the adjacent R6 zoning district and commercial overlay. This larger rezoning area is appropriate given its proximity to transit access, adjacent mid-density residential zoning districts, and the Westchester Square major shopping corridor. These actions would facilitate approximately 220 units of affordable housing for modern income households. So as a related action, the applicant is seeking a tax amendment to Appendix F to designate the project area as an MIH area with option two. This would guarantee that 30% of, of units uh, be designated up to 80% of AMI, um, meaning 69 units for this project. The applicant is also seeking funding for uh, New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development and the New York City Housing Development Corporation through the M squared program. While the affordability levels of the proposed project have not been finalized at this point, currently the applicant expects to offer units from 80% of AMI uh, to 100% of AMI. And for a point of reference, the median household income in this area is approximately $45,000. The applicant is also proposing to change the city map to eliminate, discontinue, and close an unbuilt portion of Fink Avenue between Blondell Avenue and Waters Avenue and make adjustments to the block dimensions and legal grades. And this change is necessary to facilitate the proposed development as this mapped but unbuilt portion of Fink Avenue runs through the development site, um, which you can see is in blue on this map. And in conclusion, the actions to rezone this area and apply MIH would permit the development of approximately 228 units of affordable housing, 30% of which would be permanently affordable in a mixed-use building. Thank you.
questions. Commissioner Levin. Um, yeah, I have a, some questions about the um, portion of the rezoning area that's not the development site, the portion to the south. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for laying out the land use rationale for including those. How many of the, I know, and I noticed from the pictures that a number of those um, buildings are, have for sale signs on them. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps uses, they're either vacant or, or uses are about to change. But how many current uses in that rezoning area will become non-conforming as a, you say that some of them are light industrial, or are there a bunch, are there uses that will become non-conforming as a result of? I believe I believe there might be a few, but I'd have to get back to you about this. Okay, and I, so I guess that. fundamentally the question is: Are we increasing the degree of non-conformance um, with this action, or how does it compare with uh, what, what's the before and after um, with respect to conformity, zoning conformity? Understood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions. Commissioner De La Uz. Hi, so pretty much the same question as the first one. If, you know, it'd be helpful to have rationale for mapping MIH option two given the area median income that exists in the area. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, application is certified. Item number four, uh, page 23, is a certification of a special permit in Queens, Community District 7. Uh, Hai Kong Yang is our presenter. Good afternoon. The applicant, the Matuan Group, is seeking a special permit to permit use Group 10 furniture use at 13401 20th Avenue in College Point, Queens. The project is located within an M11 zoning district and also follows the regulations of the College Point Special District. The special district does not allow use Group 10 in this portion of the district. An expansion would have to come to the CPC for review. Adjacent to the project site and along 20th Avenue towards the Whitestone Expressway is a commercial shopping center strip which includes commercial tenants such as Target, PC Riches and Son, and BJ Wholesales. The area is served by the Whitestone Expressway. The Q20A and Q76 bus provide service along 20th Avenue and 14th Avenue. A bus stop is located directly in front of the project site on 20th Avenue. The project site itself is improved as a commercial shopping center. The site is approximately 100,000 square feet and contains a ShopRite supermarket, a Petco, a bank, and a restaurant supply store. Lot 50, the subject of this special permit shown on the lower right, contains a two-story commercial building. This presentation and site plan might look familiar because on May of this year, the CPC approved a minor mod of a special permit to facilitate the development of a new one-story use group six commercial building at the southwestern portion of the site. Although on the same zoning lot and is referenced in the special permit related to the supermarket and the modification, this two-story commercial building was not the subject of the original special permit and per the language of the special permit, which applies to each new establishment and the findings of the particular establishment, the conversion of the existing building to allow for a furniture use uh, store would require a new special permit rather than a modification. The proposed special permit would allow the development use of use group 10 furniture store use on the ground floor. In addition, an as of right enlargement of 10,000 square feet on the second floor of the existing building is proposed and shown on the site plan. This will not alter the existing building footprints. The applicant will provide an additional 33 accessory parking spaces in compliance with required regulations. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, pretty straightforward. The application is certified. Item number five, page 75, is a certification of the zoning text amendment and special permits in Brooklyn Community District 1. Carenza Wood is here to present. Okay. It's coming.
He's he's doing it in the oh, back. Okay, it's, gotcha. yeah. Good afternoon. I'll be presenting an application on behalf of North 13th Street Holdings LLC for a series of land use actions. The applicant is proposing a text amendment to expand an existing industrial business incentive area and two city planning commission special permits pursuant to um, 7496 to facilitate the development of a seven story, approximately 60,000 square foot mixed office industrial and retail development located at 103 North 13th Street in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, Community District 1. The proposed project area is located within the Greenpoint Williamsburg Industrial Business Zone, shown in the uh, black outline here. It is located to the east of the current and future Bushwick Inlet Park and west of McCarran Park, with access to the G train at Nassau Avenue, the L train at Bedford Avenue, and two ferry stops at India Street and North 7th Street. And for context, the recently certified 12 Franklin Street project is located just northwest of the proposed project area. Uh, the surrounding area is located within, um, in between Greenpoint and Williamsburg. The area is largely mapped with M zoning districts. The block to the west of the project area um, is located in an M12 zoning district, which allows a maximum commercial and industrial FAR of 2.0 and a maximum com community facility FAR of 4.8. The blocks to the east are located in an M11 zoning district, which allows a maximum commercial and industrial FAR of 1.0 and a maximum community facility FAR of 2.4. There is one block north um, of the project area that is located in an M31 zoning district, which allows for a maximum commercial and industrial FAR of 2.0 and has more limitations on commercial uses. These areas consist primarily of low-scale buildings with a mix of light industrial, office, um, hotel, retail, and restaurant uses. Development in the broader area includes 25 Kent Avenue, the first ground-up office industrial building um, in this area, which is located catter corner of the project area. Other development has been um, generally limited to hotels, such as the 22-story William Vale Hotel, located directly south of the project area. The area southeast um, is located in a, a mixed-use uh, zoning district and is characterized by converted loft buildings and medium-density apartment buildings. The 35-acre McCarran Park is located to the east of the project area across Berry Street, and the first phase of Bushwick Inlet Park is located between North 9th Street and North 10th Street, and an interim phase of which is located at 50 Kent Avenue, um, which has been recently opened. When fully built out, built out, the park will stretch north to Quay Street and will total 28 acres. The proposed project area comprises block 2279, lots 1, 9, 13, 34, part, part of 15, and part of 30, bounded by North 14th Street to the north, approximately mid-block to the east, North 13th Street to the south, and White Avenue to the west. The development site is uh, one block with, is, um, sorry, one lot within the project area. The project area contains a mix of commercial and industrial uses, including an event space, an eating drinking facility, and a bowling alley, as well as um, open storage. The proposed development site is block 2279, lot 34, which is approximately um, 12,500 square feet with 125 feet of frontage on North 13th Street. The site is currently vacant. The development site was previously improved with a one-story industrial building occupied by a wholesale food distributor. The applicant demolished the building in 2014 and completed environmental remediation under the Brownfield Cleanup Program. The applicant has ex excavated the site and constructed a foundation, which was initially intended for an as-of-right building. However, the applicant had stopped work at the development site to pursue the proposed development. The proposed development is a seven-story, approximately 60,000 square foot, 4.8 FAR building containing nearly 50,000 square feet of office and retail space and nearly 10,000 square feet of light industrial space. The entrance to um, the lobby is located on North 13th Street, as are two entrances to the retail space. There is one curb cut for the entrance, um, for the entrance to the loading berth also in North 13th Street. The building will contain retail on the ground floor and in the cellar. The cellar will also contain 17 bike parking spaces. The ground floor will also contain um, the lo one loading berth and a lobby for the industrial and office space. The second floor will contain light industrial space with access to a freight elevator, and office space will occupy the upper floors. Outdoor terraces are provided at the second and sixth floors. To facilitate this development, the private application, uh, applicant is proposing a zoning text amendment to designate the project area as an industrial business incentive area, or IBIA, and two CPC special permits. 
The text amendment would establish a new IBAA and a zoning text map. A project within an IBAA can seek two special permits, one to modify the underlying FAR and building envelope, and another to modify the parking and loading requirements. In order to increase the available FAR for certain commercial and industrial uses above the underlying 2.0 FAR for permitted uses, a project must provide up to 0.8 FAR of required industrial uses. This is a set of light industrial and manufacturing uses that can more easily co-locate with commercial uses. And, and by providing this, um, the applicant is unable to, is able to unlock an additional two FAR for incentive uses, which are permis uses permitted in the M12 zoning district, with the exception of hotels, retail, food, beverage, and entertainment uses. The applicant is proposing a 4.8 FAR building and will provide 0.8 FAR of required industrial uses, as well as two FAR of incentive uses. As a condition of the floor area special permit, the underlying building envelope would no longer apply. Instead of the sky exposure plane, a contextual envelope encouraging a loft-like building is required. The maximum base height would be 75 feet, and the building could rise to a maximum height of 110 feet after a 10 to 15 foot setback. The proposed development adheres to this envelope. A set of discretionary findings must be met um, to grant the special permit, including a promoting a beneficial mix of uses and superior site planning. Per the special permit, the floor, first floor would be used primarily for permitted uses, such as retail establishments. It would also contain the lobby and one loading berth with access to a freight elevator. The second floor would be used for um, point eight FAR required industrial uses, um, which would have access to the freight elevator, which is a requirement of the special permit. The industrial space was designed to be flexible to accommodate a variety of, type of types of industrial users. The space features large column spans, 16-foot floor-to-ceiling heights, and an oversized corridor with access to the freight elevator in order to accommodate multiple users. Um, industrial users would also have access to an outdoor terrace. <coughs> the third through sixth floors would feature office space with flexible floor plates to accommodate needs of future office users, the floor area of which would be considered both incentive uses and permitted uses. Um, and, and as well, the seventh floor would um, also be used for incentive office space. The envelope of the building conforms to the envelope required for projects in the IBIA areas. The base height is 75 feet, and after a 15-foot setback, the project rises to a maximum height of approximately 110 feet. The applicant is also seeking a special permit pursuant to 72963, um, which allows modification to parking and loading requirements. Current M12 parking regulations could require the production of up to 180 parking spaces depending on use, um, as well as three loading berths. The applicant is proposing to waive the off-street parking requirement and reduce the loading berth requirement from three to one. In the statement of findings, the applicant states that the waiver and reduction of parking and loading respectively is sufficient to handle the types of employees and businesses anticipated at the site. This is another view of the proposed project. Thank you. Questions from the commission? Commissioner Dwight. Thank you. Is, is there any plans for a uh, cultural space or a not-for-profit community facility in the, in the building? That's not part of this proposal. It's um, the industrial space on the second floor and then office space above. Can, can you give me some examples of light industrial? So, so and for the applicant has proposed um, small scale manufacturers such as jewelry makers, potentially woodworkers, otherwise small, small scale maker space. Thank you. Commissioner Levin. <clears throat> yeah, I have two unrelated questions. Um, are there any um, uh, proposed tenants identified yet or is this spec? This is spec. Um, the applicant has stated again for the industrial space, probably small scale maker space, mm -hmm. and then creative tech office users um, in line with the emerging trends in the area. Yeah. It's interesting that we're seeing this project and we have Franklin, um, Franklin Street mm -hmm. pending, and I don't think either of these were potential sites when we did 25 Kent. We identified a couple of others, but not these. Um, are, I'm kind of, it's, so it's interesting to see this emerge in this mm -hmm. area. Are, are there others that are in the pipeline that we haven't yet there, heard about? There is others that have been interested, but nothing that's um, you know, close nothing to. Nothing that you're about to bring, bring to us. Right. OK. Um, and then I have an architectural question. Mm -hmm. What's the plan with that sawtoothy portion at the top? It is a distinctive architectural element, um, but it would be office space located in there. OK. Well, yeah. maybe we'll hear more about the architecture at the public hearing. Thank you. And you did pick up on what we think is a felicitous development that 25 Kent has spurred interest from others in this model that is creating industrial space. 
Um, yeah, but it also invites um, a deeper understanding of, of how, you know, is it the commercial sp demand for the commercial space that's driving it and how successful will the industrial space be and all of that, I think, uh, are, I'll be interested to see. Yep, very much so in a changing neighborhood. Yes, Commissioner Delos. That I think kind of picks up on where I was going because I know when we discussed and had the hearing for 25 cat and then approved it, whoops, um, we had anticipated I think a report back um, in terms of what have we learned um, because there were a number of other pieces to 25 cat that were proposed in particular um, uh, about uh, uh, some mission-driven um, oversight uh, of, the, of the industrial piece in particular um, in some of the incentive uses um, to see how it was going. So I'm, um, I guess I'm a little concerned, honestly, that we have seen two proposals. On the one hand, it's great. On the other hand, we haven't yet had a chance to, I think, apply any lessons learned from 25 Kent to know if we should be including them um, as part of our review. So. Um, if we could, if we could hear back about about that, that would be helpful. The building is just being completed. Okay. Just yes, Commissioner Dweck. What what processes are are in place to verify the use uh, of the industrial space? So there, uh, there's a requirement for an annual reporting done by a third party, um, selected by the city or SBS, and there's certain um, data points that are collected as part of that, and that information also has to be online. Does it require a site visit? It will, yeah. Yeah, great, thank you. Other questions? Well, yes, do we know who that might be in this case? Third party. The third parties. I, I believe in the on the other property that came to us, they already had made an agreement with Evergreen. Um, on this particular case, um, I can't when say. When it comes back, it would be yeah. helpful to know. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, this application is certified. Item six, page number 122, is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendments in Brooklyn Community District 12. Our presenter is Amy Pivik. Hello. Good afternoon. This is an application by Congregation Kazdai Belsbeth Malka for a zoning map amendment to map a C24 commercial overlay over the existing R5 district on a portion of one block in the Borough Park neighborhood of Brooklyn. The proposed action would facilitate the continued operation of a commercial banquet facility located with, within the interconnected cellar area of two existing school buildings. So the project area is located in the Borough Park neighborhood of Brooklyn, Community District 12. The project area is located in an R5 zoning district, which allows for various residential typologies at a maximum FAR of 1.25. Community facility uses are also allowed um, at an, up to an FAR of two. The R5 district um, here continues to the north and characterizes much of the surrounding area. Um, there are currently commercial overlays along several corridors in the area, including C13 and C23 overlays along Church Avenue to the north, a C13 overlay along portions of Quartel U Road right to the south, and a C23 overlay along portions of 15th Avenue. And when paired with an R5 district, these commercial overlays allow for up to one FAR of commercial use. The area is also in proximity to several M districts, which allow industrial and commercial uses. An M11 district runs directly to the east and south of the project area, and there are M12 and M21 districts to the west of the project area. And then the Ocean Parkway Special District also runs um, to the east of the project area directly across McDonald Avenue. There's a mix of uses in the immediate and surrounding area, including residences, commercial retail and office, community facilities and warehouses, and light industrial uses. The area to the north of the project area is generally mixed use in character, uh, with commercial uses lining the ground floors along McDonald Avenue. Residential buildings in the area tend to be two to three stories in height, but are varied, including single and multifamily detached, semi-detached and attached homes, in addition to apartment buildings of various sizes. Directly to the east and south of the project area are industrial and commercial uses, including garages, building supply shops, catering halls, and other commercial uses that serve the nearby uh, residential neighborhoods. And then to the west of the project area is a mix of commercial, residential, and industrial uses, including a number of warehouse and industrial buildings. The project area abuts uh, the elevated subway line of the F-Track along McDonald Avenue, which is a major thoroughfare in the area. 
the project area is accessible to transit with uh, F and G train stops at Church Avenue two blocks to the north and an F stop at Ditmas Avenue two blocks to the south. The B67 and B69 bus lines terminate just north of the project area uh, and run to downtown Brooklyn. And the B35 bus runs along Church Avenue one block to the north of the project area between Sunset Park and Brownsville. Open space resources, resources in the area include Dome Playground to the southwest, and then the Avenue C Plaza, which is a new um, plaza, a little triangle plaza, which is directly across um, from the northeast corner of the McDonald Avenue uh, site. So here on the tax map, you can see that the project area consists of seven tax lots on a single block. This is block 5369, and the lots are one, two, three, four, five, six, and 82. And the project area has frontage along McDonald Avenue, Avenue C, and Day Hill Road. Um, so this block is irregularly narrow due to the elevated rail infrastructure. Lots six and 82 outlined in red are owned by the applicant and comprise the majority of the project area. And the remaining lots, one through five, front on Avenue C and are not controlled by the applicant. Um, so here you can see the aerial view of the surrounding area. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side where the um, F train becomes elevated in the area going south. Um, so the development site, outlined in red, is currently improved with two parochial schools, um, both of which are subject to bulk variances previously granted by the Board of Standards and Appeals. Um, so in 1997, the 600 McDonald Avenue lot, which is the long, narrow red lot, um, was granted a zoning variance to permit the addition of a second floor to an existing school. Um, and additionally, this variance included a waiver of front side and rear yard requirements. And then the building at 317 Day Hill Road, which is the smaller um, one outlined in red, was constructed pursuant to a variance granted by the BSA in 2002. And this variance permitted uh, construction of a four-story school um, and included waivers for lot coverage, front side, and rear yard requirements. Um, and these two school buildings uh, on each of the lots are connected through the cellars. So here's a view of the building on lot six, which is located at 600 McDonald Avenue. It's a 28,000 square foot lot with 40 feet of frontage on Avenue C and about 655 feet of frontage on McDonald Avenue. So as I mentioned, it was expanded pursuant to a BSA variance. Um, it contains about 60,000 square feet of floor area for an FIR of 2.2. And the building is 35 feet tall um, for two stories and a basement, as well as a cellar. And here are the views um, surrounding the 600 McDonald site. You can see across the street, um, across Avenue C, there's some open storage and an auto repair. Um, to the east, you can see the infrastructure where the elevated train um, will begin to come out on McDonald Avenue. And then also the newly constructed uh, plaza as well as um, the sort of residential character um, along with a lot of ground floor um, active uses on McDonald Avenue. Um, so this is, here is lot 82, which is located at 317 Day Hill Road. And this is a uh, 10,000 square foot lot with frontage on Day Hill. Um, the school on this lot was developed pursuant to a BSA variance and it's four stories tall, contains about 30,000 square feet of floor area uh, for an FAR of 3.15. And you can see there um, the building next to it on the, on the picture to the left, as well as a view of the building and a view from further up 36th Street. And here are the surrounding views from that side. Um, the picture on the left is if you're looking slightly to the southwest, you can see some new residential development. Um, directly across from this building is a, um, it's a car repair as well as a sort of small deli. And then slightly further up 36th Street, you can see some of the surrounding character. So these are the remaining lots in the project area, lots one through five that are not owned by the applicant. Um, they include three three-family walk-up apartments and two two-family buildings, uh, one of which contains a basement level prayer room, which you can see in the photo. And then here's the view across the other portion of Avenue C. Um, you can see the character on the other side as well as some larger buildings um, up to the Northwest. So the applicant proposes a zoning map amendment to map a C24 commercial overlay over the existing R5 district in the project area. The proposed action would allow the cellar level banquet facility to be used as a commercial banquet hall for events beyond those accessory to the school. Currently, commercial uses are not permitted as of right in the R5 district. Um, and just to recap, the proposed development would, would permit the legalization and continued operation of a commercial banquet facility located within the interconnected cellar area of two existing school buildings. In total, this facility would contain 20,000 square feet of use group nine commercial use. Um, and under this new district, just to note, um, the development site would still remain subject to the previously granted bulk variances through the BSA. And I'll take questions. 
Questions from the commission? C Commissioner Cirillo. It's not so much a question, but the, <clears throat> it triggers just a thought about applications like this. So I guess I will start with a question. So the existing physical condition of the buildings are that the basement is already connected. The cellars, yes, are connected. So that's not mm -hmm. new. Right. Activity has been taking place there that now is being sought to legalize. So I'm assuming right. there was some somewhere in the middle. They got caught doing something. Okay. It was, yes. And I, I'm a firm believer of legalization. So I, I, I have no <laughs> issue with that. I mean, I, whatever. <laughs> but here's the thought that, that just comes to mind on an application like this, which we see from time to time especially when the activity beyond zoning, there are requirements for activity such as this. We're calling it a banquet hall, it's a catering hall, it would require a license to do that business beyond the zoning. Obviously this facilitates the next step, which is to be able to get a license to do this. And I've raised this issue before, but it's never clear whether or not, and this really is to protect the applicant in a long and costly process, that whether or not there have been discussions with even the zoning legalization for the use, that the physical conditions of the space would permit the kind of activity that they want to do there. For example, the right fire and, and uh, you know, public assembly space issues. And again, this is a general issue on top of the application. And I know this is just a certification, so we'll see this again and people will weigh in. But it does make me think about the coordination as planners with the other agencies involved. And I know our purview is limited. I recognize that too. But I just would hope, so I guess this is, that all of the conditions necessary for an applicant to take whatever happens with this, if successful, and actually can accomplish legally what they're trying to accomplish. Because there are other aspects to this process that are not within our purview. And, and the reason I raise that is because we are, in this rezoning, permitting other options to occur, whether it's in this application or another, that if the one, bef the hope doesn't get accomplished, what else could happen there that we are not necessarily mm -hmm. looking to facilitate, if at all? So other things could happen perhaps in that space legally under a zoning change that wasn't the original intention, but because they can't do what they want to do legally, maybe they look to something else. So I just think we should be thinking about that. If the applicants in the audience or their representatives, we should have, we should learn more about have they pursued, uh, you know, no guarantee at the end of the process either, but have they pursued understanding what would be required next. Mm -hmm. and so I would just note one thing which I didn't mention um, is that it, you know, during school hours, this area is used as the dining facility for the students. Mm -hmm. So it's currently fitted out to, you know, host large numbers of, of students um, at their mealtime okay. and would, you Understood. know, is still part of the school. And that so. sounds like mm -hmm. the accessory use, which is right. permissible there today without mm -hmm. the rezoning. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The, well, obviously the intent behind creating or, or seeing this application go forward is because it potentially uh, opens the door to revenue producing mm -hmm. events open mm -hmm. to the public. And so there's a whole host Sorry. of other issues that grow with the public's access to this building mm -hmm. that the accessory use would not. And I just want to make sure we're helpful in this process too, and that we're planting the seed yep. for the applicant to be doing more homework beyond this. But yeah. we should know what all the options are. If we do this and it's not possible, what else are we opening the door to do? And this goes for any application, because we've seen this kind of thing before. I would also note uh, to your point that I think that our in our report, we can call out 
that well, we're not the experts as to all the other permits that are required, that there are likely additional permits and licensing requirements. I, I also will add um, that I'm familiar with the site, um, that the, the sort of in-between, as you described it, was actually that the BSA discovered that there was a commercial catering facility. Uh, at this this site, and um, I can say that the fire department and DOB are both aware of it and have inspected and have had many conversations with the owners and operators of this. And so I think, I mean, the applicants can speak to this uh, with more, but I think that there is more assurance that they can do what they need to be able to do to make this legal. In, in, in this case, but the point is taken in, in a broader sense. Thank you. Mr. Levin. Um, well, that glances off a kind of related question that I have. If you look, just look at the zoning map, putting a commercial overlay here looks like kind of an anomaly from a Can you call up the land use slide? planning perspective. It's um, not much commercial activity anywhere around. So, um, and I guess, um, it's kind of hard to see. Since these schools exist there subject to BSA special permits, <laughs> um, and the materials we have indicate that <clears throat> they would continue to be subject to the jurisdiction of those BSA permits, those BSA permits were premised on the need for schools at this location. Mm -hmm. So how do you justify commercial catering activity if the whole reason these places, th these buildings are configured as they are is because we need to provide educational space? Mm -hmm. So I'm not yeah. convinced I see the and the, the applicants will definitely speak more to and, that. And why this shouldn't be, what, what the relationship is between this as a text amendment to the BSA special permits and couldn't this use mm -hmm. be more appropriately covered by an amendment of the BSA permit? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that the BSA is really looking at the bulk of the buildings, and you can see that one lot <clears throat> on 600 McDonald is quite long and narrow, so yes, it is yes, kind of a strange please. lot, which is, a, <laughs> right. you know, of course, yeah. why it makes sense for them to be at the BSA. Um, and I know that the BSA wasn't comfortable dealing with the, the use request there, so that's why they asked for them to come to us to legalize the use through a rezoning. Oh. Um, there is a okay. lot of, you know, there is a lot of mixed activity in the area, I would say, like a lot more than I even realized when I was out there recently. Um, so, you know, right across the street, there's commercial, there's a lot of, you know, borders manufacturing districts with industrial and commercial uses. It is pretty mixed in that area, but your, yeah. your points are well taken. Well, we'll hear more when we come back for mm -hmm. a hearing. And, you yeah. know, ultimately, it also depends on what the local community thinks is appropriate. Exactly. And if the catering hall has been operating there... Mm -hmm. For a while anyway, there will be a track record and um, perhaps we'll hear yes. what the community's experience was in having that facility active, which will also be relevant. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Dweck. Do we know of any complaints to date, speaking of the community input? Yes. From um, a, a neighboring property owner has complained about traffic. Traffic. So that's what, it's mostly the traffic that we're aware of, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Marin. Well, that, that kind of brings to play another question. Do, is there a parking facility that they're using? Okay, yes. Yeah. So they are currently leasing a space for 50 cars. Um, as part of their EAS, they did a parking study. Um, and when they speak, they can go into more detail about their study. Um, but they currently lease a space and they have valet valet parking um, on the lot in the lot for 50 spaces um, and then they otherwise use surrounding streets for parking. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, the application is certified. Thanks. Item number seven, page 143, is a review of a non euler restrictive declaration in Manhattan Community District 4. Annie White is here to present. I'll just note that Commissioner Cirillo is recused from this item. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Good.
Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, again, this is a application for the City Planning Commission approval of a restrictive declaration for the event space at Manhattan West. The applicant for this is a subsidiary of Brookfield Properties. Um, the property, again, is located in the area that we call Manhattan West, which is sub area B2 of the Special Hudson Yards District and Manhattan Community Board 4. Pursuant to the Special Hudson Yards zoning, the event space, which is a portion of the Central Plaza in Manhattan West, may be closed for 12 private events a year um, upon the City Planning Commission approval of a restrictive declaration. So we'll give a little bit of background into you know, what the zoning is and what why this restrictive declaration is in front of you today. So um, in the original Hudson Yards rezoning in 2005, um, there were many open spaces and public access areas that were um, required pursuant to the zoning. Um, Manhattan West is the kind of mega block outlined here in the red rectangle, and there were required public access areas um, on the Manhattan West site in B2. Those public access areas, areas were further defined with design requirements in a text amendment in 2014. Um, the primary um, uh, impetus for this text amendment was to allow for a phased development of Manhattan West, so certain public access areas are tied to the development of the properties on Manhattan West. Um, the event space is this um, portion indicated in red here in the center of what we call the central plaza. Um, that event space is limited to um, 4,500 square feet and it does have certain requirements where it has to be a certain distance from the avenue. Um, and in this initial 2014 text, that's when the provision was included that this event space may be closed um, for up to 12 private events a year pursuant to this restrictive declaration. You might remember uh, I was just in front of you last year uh, with the Manhattan West uh, public access areas again for an additional text amendment um, which further defined design requirements and, um, and signage requirements of the Central Plaza and other public access areas. Um, but this text amendment did not actually touch that provision um, that allowed for the 12 private event closures. And, it's, and I wanted to pull up this illustrative plan. Um, as you can see, the kind of um, event space that's that circular area there. And what's important to note is even when this um, space will be closed to um, a private event, there is still public access throughout the plaza. So there still be through public traffic um, from either end, even when that um, central event space might be closed. So that uh, this is how we get the text today, which says the City Planning Commission may allow the closing of the event space for up to 12 private events per year pursuant to the restrictive declaration, which was um, included in your briefing packages. So I'll just kind of quickly run through some of the details of the um, of the closure of private events that were clarified through this restrictive declaration. So it clarified that um, that an event, a private event, is actually uh, one calendar day from you know midnight to midnight, um, and that an event may not exceed that one calendar day. Um, events cannot be held on consecutive days. However, one event may include three consecutive days and may occur over, and that may occur over an entire weekend. Um, but just to note that you know with the when it's consecutive days, those are all individual calendar days, so individual events. So that three day. Um, event is still three three days. Um, and additionally, um, the uh, owner must give public notice of any closure. Um, this includes erecting a sign at each of the entrances to the central plaza and event space. And then additionally, the owner must give a uh, seven days notice to Manhattan Community Board 4 of any closure. I um, wanted to end on this illustrative um, uh, rendering just to show you what that, the, that space um, might look like and happy to answer any questions about this. Yes, Commissioner Levin. So, Annie, welcome back. <laughs> so you're toting this project around from yes. year to year. Yes. I'm glad you're still on the case. <laughs> um, so we're just being asked to approve the restrictive declaration, and that we get to do just on our own, right? There's no referral. Yes. This is not a referral. That's correct. Um, has, uh, nonetheless, is um, Community Board 4 aware that this is? They are. And have they? Mm -hmm expressed any views that we ought to be made aware of? They they certainly had considered this um, back in the previous text amendments. They know that the um, the 
provision will require them to enter into this restrictive declaration. To my knowledge, they haven't um, had any questions or qualms with and it. And this simply implements the restrictions that are already in the text anyway. It's that's, not a, that's, a departure. There's no design judgment here. There's That's true. And, and the restrictive declaration even goes a bit further just to kind of define, you know, the, the last slide that I brought up goes a bit further to define like what actually is a private event. And we also have the um, requirements for the um, public notice, which we borrowed from similar plaza closings and pops and the like. Okay. Good. Um, when is this um, public space set to be open to the public? They're getting, they're moving along on their development. They're moving along, and they were um, quite eager to bring this in front of the commission because I think they're wanting to start planning these private events. I don't have an exact date. I'm happy to follow up on that. Thank you. And Annie, can you call back the um, the provisions of the restrictive deck? Sure. The one thing that I want to clarify on the third uh, bullet point mm -hmm. that says one event may take place on a weekend, th what that means is one event can take place that covers both days of the weekend, but that can only occur once. Um, otherwise, the events could only take place on one of the weekend days. And I will note that if an event takes place across both days of the weekend, it counts as two events. That's two, it goes counts as two against the 12. Yes, Commissioner Capelli. Yep, those are the exceptions to the broader rules of applicability. It's just not worded. It's their inconsistent concepts. Yeah, I would, um, the restrictive deck itself will explain it clearly. This is just the summary version on it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Dweck. Just from a party planning kind of purpose. <laughs> uh, You're looking forward to your invitation to the first event? <laughs> uh, 12 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. So what would happen if an event started at 8 p.m. and went till 1 a.m.? Would, what, what? That would be a two-day event but then you wouldn't be able to have two consecutive calendar days. So perhaps it could be a, a, a 24 hour period or? or I mean. We think about it from the point of view of the public and that the public has certainty about the amount of time that it will be taken away from public use. And so being more conservative, I think is actually more protective of the public. Right, okay, point there now. Okay, so um, since as Commissioner Levin previewed, this is something that where it is the determination of the commission, I would ask for an assent by show of hands to approve the restrictive deck embodying these terms. Thank you, so approved. Item eight, page 215 is a pre-hearing review of the zoning map and zoning text amendment in Brooklyn Community District 2. Our presenter is Daphne Lundy. Good afternoon. This is a private application by Foreman Ferry LLC requesting a zoning map amendment to rezone an M14 R8A district to an M16 R8X district within the MX2 special mixed use district. The applicant is also requesting a text amendment to add R8X to the list of residential districts mapped in the MX2 special district and to allow the base street wall height of developments in the rezoning area to be raised based on the street wall heights of adjacent buildings. The East River is to the north of the site. The surrounding blocks are split between Vinegar Hill and Brooklyn Navy Yard to the east, Bridge Plaza to the south, and Brooklyn Heights to the west. The project area is bounded by John Street, a primarily industrial and commercial corridor to the north, J Street, a major north-south corridor to the west, and Plymouth Street, a commercial and residential corridor to the south. The project area is located in the MX2 Special Mixed Use District and is mapped with M14 R8A. The surrounding area is, lo is also located within the Dumbo Historic District. The private applicant is proposing to build a new 11-story, approximately 189,000 square foot Class A office building with ground floor retail. 
The ground floor will contain approximately 8,000 square feet of retail space, while the upper floors will contain approximately 15,000 square feet of office space on each level. The floor to ceiling heights would range from 12 to 16 feet. The applicant is proposing to rezone the M14 R8A district to an M16 R8X district. The applicant is also requesting a text amendment to add R8X to the list of residential districts mapped in MX2 and to also allow the base street wall height of developments in the rezoning area to be raised based on street wall heights of adjacent buildings, including buildings located across the street. The proposed actions were certified and referred out by the department on June 25, 2018. The CB2 Land Use Committee voted unanimously to recommend that the board support the zoning map change and the text amendment. On August 27th, the executive committee voted six in favor, one opposed, and one abstention to ratify the land use committee recommendation. On August 23rd, the borough president held a public hearing. On October 5th, the borough president recommended to approve the proposed map amendment and disapprove the proposed text amendment based on the following conditions that the proposed M16 R8X district be modified to an M16 R8A district that in lieu of the text amendment to the MX text, that the applicant chooses to file an amendment to the 74-711 LPC special permit and to make the special permit applicable to non-contributing buildings within historic districts. The applicant would then um, mo uh, apply for the modified um, LPC special permit for bulk waivers. The board president also recommends a written commitment to the city council to set aside a portion of the commercial space for nonprofit organizations such, in, such, as art and cultural ent such as art and cultural entities, to integrate additional resiliency and sustainability measures into the design of the building, and to retain Brooklyn-based contractors and subcontractors, especially those who are designated as LBEs and MWBEs. And I'll be happy to take questions. Questions from the commission. Commissioner Dweck. Yeah, can you speak to uh, the borough president's uh, recommendation and specifically to the uh, set aside of space for, uh, I believe it was cultural use and not community facility? Right. Um, in the recommendation, um, in the recommendation, um, they basically stated that it would be a great opportunity to locate sort of a local business or arts and cultural space. Um, the applicant stated that they were amenable to that pending, you know, the cost being appropriate and the uh, finding the right tenant. I think that the, the borough president was looking for uh, some kind of commitment or some form of commitment from the applicant or? Um, I can look into what the formal uh, language is and the um, applicant can speak to that as well. Thank you so much. Other questions? Okay, this will go to a public hearing on Wednesday. Items 9, 10, and 11 are post-referral review of modifications to previously approved special permits and authorizations. This will also serve as a pre-hearing discussion of a draft environmental impact statement uh, in Manhattan Community District 3. Our presenter is Bob Tuttle. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, this proposal consists of three independent land use applications that each seek modifications to different zoning lots within the same large scale residential development. JDS development is the applicant for the 247 Cherry Street site. LM Development Partners and CIM Group are the co-applicants for the 260 South Street site. And Sterrett Development is the applicant for the 259 Clinton Street site. Now, before we discuss the proposals, I'd like to take a moment to highlight the basis under which a land use action is considered to be a modification of an existing large-scale development special permit. Commission authorizations or special permits are required only when a proposed development does not comply with one or more of the zoning provisions and requires a zoning waiver. If a proposed development complies with all applicable zoning regulations, then there is nothing to waive and no action to require. In this case, the proposed projects are not requesting new zoning actions, such as a, zoning, a new zoning district. Uh, they're not requesting waivers to the proposed developments, such as a, site, a height and setback waiver, um, and are not requesting modifications to the waivers for those existing buildings. This is because the proposed projects are as of right per the C64 zoning district rules. However, these sites are within a large-scale development. 
which makes it necessary to verify that the findings made for the previously granted authorizations and special permits for the existing buildings in the large scale remain valid and to update the LSRD site plan and floor area calculations before permits can be issued by DOB. Since the proposed developments would comply with the underlying zoning and the findings made for previously granted authorizations and special permits remain valid, this proposal is a modification to an existing large scale development and the applicant is required to update the large scale site plan and the large scale floor area calculations in order to show that the existing and proposed floor area do not exceed what is permitted by the underlying zoning district. I'd also like to draw the commission's attention to the unprecedented EIS process for these three applications. First, the three applicant teams have undertaken a joint EIS to ensure that all cumulative and project specific potential impacts were identified and can be addressed through the public process mandated by the New York State Environmental Conservation Law. Secondly, the applicant team hosted four community outreach sessions that focused on the proposed projects and the associated environmental review. These sessions included discussions regarding affordable housing, socioeconomics, open space, shadows, transportation, community facilities, and construction. Uh, now a bit about the neighborhood context. The built context in the area is varied and generally steps up block, block by block from East Broadway towards the river. South of Seward Park, the built context is characterized by tenement and pre-war buildings ranging generally in height from one to 10 stories. This area is ringed to the north, east, and west with tower in the park building typology that includes building clusters ranging from 16 to 21 stories. And then buildings within the LSRD are as varied as the surrounding blocks, ranging from one to 27 stories. Just west of the LSRD, construction is underway on the as of right 78-story building and a 13-story affordable building. The Two Bridges large-scale residential development, shown here in red, and the lots just east and west have been zoned C64 since the zoning resolution was enacted in 1961. C64 districts per permit an as of right maximum 10 commercial FAR and have an R10 residential equivalent. That R10 district has an as of right maximum 10 residential FAR, 12 when affordable units are provided, and a 10 community facility um, maximum FAR. The L LSRD was previously within the Two Bridges Urban Renewal Area and was governed by the Two Bridges Urban Renewal Plan. Now the Urban Renewal Plan was adopted in 1967 and it expired by its own terms um, in May of 2007. The Urban Renewal Plan has not been in effect for over 10 years. However, the LSRD and C64 zoning district remain and continue to govern development. The Two Bridges LSRD contains six parcels which are outlined in black. Um, that were developed pursuant to a series of authorizations and special permits granted by the commission over a 23 year period between 1972 and 1995. The, uh, the three zoning lots outlined in blue are those where development is proposed. Um, each site would include a 25% affordable housing component, which would produce up to 694 units out of the total 2,775 units. The proposed development on parcel four, outlined in purple, is a mixed use 80 story building, including a small retail space of approximately um, 2,400 square feet and up to 660 new residential units, of which 165 would be permanently affordable. The private open space, shown in yellow on the site, um, would be improved. The proposed development on parcel five is for a mixed use building, including um, 1,350 new residential units, of which 338 would be permanently affordable. 100 of the permanently affordable units are proposed to be for seniors. The development would consist of two towers on a shared base, um, and that's outlined in purple at the southern portion of the lot. The east tower would be approximately 70 stories, and the west tower would be approximately 63 stories. The 103 existing surface parking spaces would be located in a garage um, in the lower level of that new building. An existing ground floor retail along Cherry Street, outlined in purple on the northern portion of the lot, would be enlarged by approximately 5,300 square feet. A private courtyard, shown in the middle in yellow, would be improved, and the applicant intends for the space to be available to the public. The open space along Rutgers Slip, shown in green, would also be improved. This space is currently available to the public, <laughs> and through this application, it would officially be designated as publicly accessible open space. This will ensure that the improved space remains available to the public. 
And parcel six, um, 6A, the proposed development on parcel 6A is for a mixed use 63 story building, including a small retail space of approximately 2,400 square feet and up to 765 new residential units, of which 191 would be permanently affordable. 100 of the permanently affordable units are proposed to be for seniors. The proposed development is also requesting to modify the retail continuity requirement that applies along Clinton Street, um, since Clinton Street is a wide street. The retail space is instead planned to be located along South Street, uh, which functions more as a main thoroughfare. Um, and this would include outdoor space in front with plantings and seating for the public. Now the joint EIS analyzed all 19 environmental categories um, with 14 of those categories showing no significant adverse impacts. The potential for impacts were identified in five of the categories. The mitigation proposed for the draft, pardon me, the mitigation proposed in the draft EIS is a combination of what the applicant team heard through the community outreach sessions and consultation with city and state agencies, such as the Department of Parks and Recreation and MTA. Mitigation measures identified in the DIS are explored further between the draft and final version of the EIS based on community input, such as testimony that we'll hear at Wednesday's public hearing and written comments, and through additional consultation with city and state agencies. This proposal was referred to um, Manhattan Community Board 3 on June 25th for 60 days. Due to the scheduling of the CPC public hearing, the actual review period was more than 100 days. And during that period, the community board held three community meetings on this proposal, one of which was de dedicated public hearing. The community board submitted a recommendation to deny approval of the proposed modifications to the Two Bridges large scale, which is in your briefing package. Um, this decision was largely based on the community's belief that these applications should be subject to ULERP. Also in your briefing materials is the community board's comments on the DEIS. Um, as a standard procedure, these comments and all public comments will be reviewed in their totality and responded to holistically in the response to comment section of the final EIS for the public and the commissioners to review. Um, and then just a process note, the public comment period will end at the close of business on October 29th um, per the secret rules. And once the final EIS is completed, it will be published and the CPC's vote will be scheduled at least 10 days later, also per secret rules. Um, and at this time, I'm happy to answer any uh, clarifying questions and I can pass along any project specific questions to the applicants in preparation for Wednesday's public hearing. Questions from the commission? 11. Um, well, I have a large question that <clears throat> I don't, Bob, intend you to answer, but to put out there as what I'm hoping to understand out of the public hearing. Sure. And that is more about the process that's being applied here for the modification. Um, your slide on page two um, suggests that our measure here is simply whether these um, three new proposals um, comply with underlying zoning and whether they would lead to non-compliance with the, for, for the buildings that have previously been built, the, the permits that have per previously been issued. Correct. Um, uh, I know that that is a standard that um, has been applied in a number of other cases that's not unique to this, it's not being invented for this application. But I think the scale of what's being proposed here has invited a deeper inquiry into um, where that process comes from, where it's rooted in zoning. And I think the materials that the community board has provided to us, and in particular the letter from Tough Lower East Side, um, gives us some bigger context from this and leads to some bigger questions. Um, I guess fundamentally, I need help understanding the continuing role of the um, large scale, the existing, the, the large scale special permit as it exists on the books today. The permit requires, you know, allows development according to the plans that were reflected at the time the permit was approved. Um, so that lays out a site plan and a zoning calculation that's a schedule of this is what you can build here. Um, they're now proposing to build um, quite a bit more, fill in some of the holes in the site plan, and um, increase the amount of built floor area quite substantially. 
So um, it seems to me that we're modifying that plan to a degree that goes beyond minor. Um, and uh, one, I'm wondering to myself why a new Euler shouldn't be required um, given the degree of change that's being proposed here. So I will um, answer this to a bit because this is a determination made by the department and not by the applicants. Um, and similar to our, our determination um, in 2014 with healthcare chaplaincy, also on this site, um, the modification determination is made just on purely technical, um, uh, a stand, from a purely technical standpoint. So the underlying zoning exists and these projects are all complying with that underlying zoning. And so if there were no large scale here, there would be no process um, for city planning. Um, however, there is a large scale, and what is required then for that large scale is to open up the special permit through a modification so that the site plan can be adjusted and um, correct, or, and the new buildings added so that it shows the current status, um, or the proposed status in this case, um, and that our technical review division can verify that the zoning actually exists, so the amount of floor area to be used exists. But other than that, we, we provide only a very um, technical review of the application. Generally, um, we don't see these have um, environmental review, so we wouldn't be at this point today that we're at, um, but because three projects were happening simultaneously, um, it was clear that there needed to be an analysis of the, the possible impacts, which is why the joint EIS um, was um, the directive given by the agency to the applicant teams. Um, but it really is a very technical matter. We do see these as large developments. Um, this is the most affordable housing on, through you know, a, a set of developments since 1975 in Lower Manhattan, since Confucius Plaza. So that's significant. We understand that. However, since they're complying with the C64 zoning, um, they're, they're just a minor mod in this large scale. Yeah, I understand that's okay. the I understand that's um, the agency's position on this, and I understand that it's also not unique that the agency has taken this position <clears throat> on similar actions in the past. But I look at the um, text of the the plan itself, and it says that uh, parcel four is to be developed with low income housing, and parcel uh, five and six with moderate income housing. Well, we're changing that here, um, and I think that the um, I guess I need help understanding the, the, the root of the agency's position in the zoning resolution and the rules and the, you know, the, the procedural rules that apply what we can do here. Um, not simply that that's the way we've always done it. You know, I suspect ultimately this is a question um, that some judge is going to have to decide um, because a practice has developed over time and no one has really shone the spotlight on why that practice exists the way it does. Um, but I think this is a case that sort of highlights the, the, the disconnect because the, you know, maybe the previous ones that have come along um, have <coughs> not been such, such substantial um, changes. This one is admittedly pretty substantial. I mean, I will note that the agency um, has not um, conducted large-scale developments like this for quite a while. Right. Um, large scales today are um, much more shrink-wrapped um, and yeah. defined. Yeah. Um, this large scale was developed over 23 years um, through you know, numerous special permits and authorizations. Um, also during that time, there was an urban renewal plan that governed a lot of the, the um, focus of where the housing should be directed to and what income levels. Um, but those, the urban renewal plans expire by their own nature, and this one did. And so I think that has changed how the site can be developed. I mean, it certainly has changed how the site can be developed. Um, but yeah, those but are all things that, that still, we are thinking. Some of that is still reflected in the plan, the large scale plan. I, I, I understand that the urban renewal plan is gone. Right. But some of the large scale plan remains. Um, so. Correct. Right. 
to the extent that it doesn't come out in the public hearing by the applicant, because as Bob said, it's the department's determination, we'll be glad to provide you with additional analysis as part of the post-hearing follow-up. Okay, I, you know, I think the public is gonna be very interested in that. We're gonna hear about it, um, as reflected in the written testimony that we've already received. I think For the sure. issue is on the table. Commissioner Deleuze. Just, just in terms of similar follow-up, I think it's really about three separate issues needing to be divided. Like there, there's like what's pursuant to zoning, what's pursuant to the large scale, and what what was pursuant to the now expired urban renewal plan and understanding, you know, the, how each gets applied. And I think that'll be something for us to talk about as, as part of our, uh, you know, post-hearing follow-up. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Going from that very big issue <laughs> to um, a, a, a somewhat more detailed one, um, I know in, in looking at this proposal, we talked about and, and noted transportation impact um, and that some of the mitigation would be reflected in um, subway um, improvements with respect to the stairways. And um, it was surprising to see that the secret technical manual does not um, uh, require an assessment of now, you know, alternative mobility options, particularly cycling. Um, and, um, you know, knowing this neighborhood, knowing how popular um, something like City Bike is, knowing the proximity to the um, uh, East River um, bike path, which is extremely well utilized, um, you know, it's surprising that, and I recognize we can't apply um, those mitigations <laughs> um, here, but it, it would seem very important to um, allow for this community to have access to an alternative mode of transportation that is, is very popular, very well utilized, and that would in fact reduce subway usage. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, at any given time in the morning, you try to get a city bike in that location, there are no bikes. Um, because of its location, yet it's very proximate to, um, you know, our employment centers and it's easy to get to. But so those, those are issues that I'd very much like to see addressed and, and have the developer speak to um, how they might incorporate um, some of those measures, even though they're not required to do so. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Marin. Thank you for the presentation. Um, one, one of the um, significant adverse impacts on the EIS is the open space. Is there any plan to, or any thoughts about how that would be mitigated? Um, there are, so the, so on site five um, in the green, so this is an upfront agreement from the applicant team. So they have committed um, to the space in green as um, public open space. Right now this functions, um, or it does allow public access, but there's no requirement that it be open to the public. So they have written this into their project um, that this would be considered publicly open space. Um, and at that point, at, at this point, um, they have committed to that. The DIS also identifies park improvements at three area parks, um, but that is still very much the subject of um, further conversation. Um, you know, we certainly want to hear from the public um, at the public hearing about this. We want to see what the written comments are. Uh, and then also, um, there's always the further consultation with the Parks Department before the FEIS. Um, and, as always, your input is um, appreciated in helping determine that and strengthen those, um, the mitigations that are identified in the draft because they are just proposed at this point, um, but they're up for discussion. It won't be final until we get to the final EIS. And also on, on, on the community facility spaces, sorry. On, on the community facility spaces, is there any opportunity um, in any of those ground floor spaces that they're proposing to maybe accommodate community facilities? any type of community facility? There may be. So there are um, two impacts that have been identified um, or potential impacts that have been identified. One is in um, elementary school seats um, and the other is in childcare slots. Um, school seats are often um, handled with, so I think there are, I think if I'm remembering right, it's maybe 19 school seats, maybe 16. Um, the applicant can speak to that on Wednesday, but in those cases, generally it's a, um, there's something worked out with DOE 
um, because they want to obviously have those students at those schools or at the nearby schools. With childcare slots, it's a little bit more open. There is the ability to have um, a payment. Um, there's also ability to set aside space for um, the childcare facility if at the time that the impact is triggered, um, ACS can find a, um, an appropriate um, child care center that wants to locate there. So those are things that could, could um, present themselves as options that could be written into the restrictive declaration. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Ortiz. Um, I would also like to, um, you know, uh, ha have the applicant speak to some of the shadow impacts on the Cherry Clinton playground, which um, I think are fairly significant um, to the extent that we can have a conversation around that. Sure. Other issues? Okay, we will have a uh, vibrant public hearing on Wednesday. Thank you. Okay, uh, also on the public uh, meeting on October 17th, staff have prepared reports uh, for the following. Uh, the M1 Hotel text amendment, um, the Friends of Crown Heights 17, it's a continuing use of the child care center, uh, DOT Brooklyn Fleet Services, 420 Kent Avenue, uh, the UFBCO Child Care Center, and 9 Orchard Street. Uh, for the public meeting on October 31st, decisions are scheduled for the following 238 President Street, a landmark designation, and the Hans S. Christian Memorial Kindergarten, also a landmark designation. Uh, for post-hearing follow-up, Okay, uh, on the Garment Center text amendment, uh, Dylan Sandler is here for discussion. Good afternoon. So there were a couple of items at the public hearing uh, for the Garment Center a couple weeks ago that I wanted to follow up on. Um, Commissioner Efron asked whether building owners ever sought relief through a variance when they were unable to find manufacturing tenants um, rather than illegally converting space. Um, so we have very good data from the BSA since 1998, and in the last 20 years there was one variance uh, to convert manufacturing space to office in the garment center. Uh, this was in 2012 for a 14-story commercial building. Um, we've also put in a request to BSA to learn if there were any variance applications or approvals uh, prior to 1998, but haven't yet received any information about that. Um, but then more broadly, we, we also wanted to say that we, we don't really think that a variance is the right mechanism or the right uh, remedy in this situation, um, because a variance is typically where the property has a, a unique hardship that relates to the, the property and not the, the broader area and sort of an incompatibility with zoning and, and broader economic trends. Um, so for this reason, we, we think that it's it's really upon city planning, it's, it's city planning's obligation to have a zoning framework that is appropriate for the broader district and not uh, sort of push that, that land use, um, those land use decisions on a broader scale to the BSA. Um, additionally, during the public hearing, there were um, a few questions about um, why property owners in the district chose to illegally convert space um, and, and moreover, why they were unable to find manufacturing tenants. Um, and, and we can't speak conclusively to the, the motivations of, of, manufac or of property owners, but we think it's important to stress that at that time, uh, the industry was declining at about 13% a year, and so it does seem very likely that there were property owners who uh, were not able to, to find uh, tenants to fill space and, and really were, were having to choose between keeping manufacturing space vacant or uh, choosing to illegally convert space to office. Um, there were also a couple of questions for EDC about the IDA program and, and the building purchase program. Um, and responses to these questions were submitted in a memo last week to the commission from EDC. Uh, so I'd be happy to um, respond to either of those issues or, or an answer any other questions. Questions from the commission. Commissioner Levin. Well, it's only been two weeks, but I'm wondering if there's any more news on the effort to recruit 
um, building owners to um, the IDA program um, and where we stand. I guess the RFP got issued. Yeah, so, the so with the, the building acquisition, the, the RFEI was, was released on October 3rd, so um, almost a couple weeks ago. Um, and there's a, there's a public information session scheduled for October 25th. Um, so, so this is this is out, and I know EDC is, is actively sort of engaging with with nonprofits and uh, trying to you know to, to find interest for the program. Um, for the IDA program, I, I'm not aware of any of any additional property owners that have signed on uh, in the last two weeks. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is something we have to keep an eye on. It, uh, honestly, the those incentives are really um, essential in my mind to the relief that we're providing to building owners in this zoning resolution and you know it'll be hard to allow one to happen without the other so i do hope that um, i mean fortunately this is non ulerp so i don't know what kind of timetable we're on here um, but i hope we can see more progress toward um, really solidifying those intended incentives um, before we implement the zoning change other questions or comments? Thank you, Dylan. Thank you. Um, moving on to the Marcus Garvey large scale general development. Um, there was a letter in your package regarding Franklin Avenue rezoning. Kevin is here. You were you speaking or did you just. This was also mentioned about oh, the. Abbey. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, there was a question raised by the commission at the uh, review session a few weeks back about the involvement of the AFI parcels. Um, so we actually reached out to HPD, who reached out to the Asian Americans for Equality um, about their two sites. Uh, AFI expressed that CP6 Crown Heights have approached them in the past year about purchasing the two parcels, which AFI declined. Um, they actually have interest in, in developing their two parcels uh, for affordable housing units for senior development. Um, they're waiting to see how this proposed rezoning um, progresses. If it is approved, they are looking at um, developing senior housing. They believe they could accommodate up to 50 units of housing on the site. But right now they're taking an approach where they're seeing where the rezoning will end up. Thank you. Sure. I'm the one that asked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, Any other business before the commission? I think that's it. Okay. And so our meeting is closed. This concludes the public review session for Monday, October 15th, 2018. The time is 2.56.